This episode of Own the Grey is brought to you by I Am. Discover your unique talents, realize your potential, and align to your path. Take the first step to uncover your life purpose by visiting deborahjones.ca slash courses. Welcome to Own the Grey. I'm Deborah Jones, and I am excited to start off season three with a focus on self empowerment. I'll be talking to people who inspire us to ignite our inner power so that we can start living our passions and talents. Word power, it's often misunderstood and misdirected. And today's guest will help us understand the difference between power over versus power with, or more simply between egoic power and soulful power. This confusion often prevents us from stepping into our power. But before I introduce him, I invite you to take a moment to consider the life you've created. Are you happy with your choices? Do you feel empowered or do you tend to give away your power to other people or circumstances? Have you had enough of saying yes when inside you really mean no? Well, this episode will help you to get back on the path you came here to walk on, your hero's journey. Welcome to On the Gray a podcast to dispel the notion that aging is undesirable and setting new positive attitudes. I'm Deborah Jones, and I believe you can be vibrant and healthy throughout the best years of your life. Your hero's journey is the one where you are the hero who goes on an adventure, makes critical choices, and wins a victory that changes or transforms you. It's a courageous, meaningful journey that we all have the option to take. And on this journey, you make choices, the consequences of which lead you to greater self-awareness and self-confidence. Well, I believe there are no wrong choices, but lessons on every path. And I like to think we're playing a game the game of life, and that no matter whether we choose the high road or the low road, we arrive at the same place. The only difference is the story we get to tell. Well, my next guest has an interesting transformation story from being shy, introverted, and filled with self-doubt to becoming an internationally renowned speaker and an award-winning author. And for 30 years, he has helped people gain personal empowerment, filling their lives with meaning and purpose and having the kind of relationships they've longed for. I've just finished reading his new book, Awakening the Soul of Power. And in this introspective guide, he offers a blueprint for self-awareness and introduces a concept called deconstructing our relationship to power. Now, if you've ever struggled with relationships, self-doubt, or questioned your purpose, this book explores how you can step back into your power in a new way that's not about egoic power, but a more authentic inner power that you've always had, but haven't necessarily been using. Warm welcome to Own the Gray, Christian Della Huerta. Hi, Deborah. Thank you so much for having me. What a beautiful introduction. I'm I'm touched. Thank you. I'm so thrilled that you've chosen to spend some time with us to transform more lives. And there's something about, well, I, I loved reading your book. It's a very easy read and it's got lots of really useful tips and things in it. But you write about your observation that humanity is at a critical juncture in our evolution. Um, I've heard it as the sixth extinction, and it's a time where we we either make it or break it. And you suggest that if you've had just the slightest suspicion that you've got work to do as a teacher, a healer, or an activist for change, that the time is now. And I wanted to ask you, what is your vision for the work that you do? 
Yeah, that's a really great question because I, I I do share that sense of urgency. I I do think that it is all hands on deck at this point. And paraphrasing Einstein, who who said that you can't solve a problem from the same level of consciousness in which it was created. When I look at the world and the shape that that we're in, and all the problems that we're facing, any one of which can feel completely overwhelming. I think, you know, how do how can we possibly dig ourselves out of this hole that we have dug ourselves into collectively? And the answer that I come up with is it's got to be a shift in consciousness, a leap in revolution, a leap in consciousness, a, a spiritual revolution, something that's going to shift the way we see ourselves, the way we see each other, and the way that we see the the the, the earth, the this tiny pebble um, that is our home in, in this humongous space in which we live. And so I see my work. That's how I frame it. What can I do to support that leap in consciousness? How can I continue waking myself up and healing myself and impacting and inspiring as many others to do the same? Um, and yeah, you know, for I work with so many people who, who've had that suspicion. I work with coaches that have been, in some cases, had a certification for 10 years. And I so, said, you know what, sorry, but we just don't have that kind of time anymore. It really does feel to me like it's all hands on deck. And, and not from a, a fear-based perspective. It's more from like, all right, let's get to it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's exactly how I'm feeling too, is that, you know, I, I train um, healers to become healers. And, you know, it's it's okay getting as you said, the studies, the certifications and things like that, but you've got to do something with it because that's why you took it in the first place, even if you didn't realize it at the time. But it's, it is like a, a rallying call for everybody to step into their power. That's the way I see it. And, exactly. and But not everybody knows how to do that. And that's why I'm really excited about your book because it's telling us how to do that. You know, it's it's kind of deconstructing um, what we've what we've learned, what we understand, and you, you're really telling us the truth about power and what it is and what it isn't. And and you know, it, it's that rallying cry that we do need to step into our power. And and that's that's really been my message the whole time that I've been working with clients. So that stepping into the power. Why do you think that that has been so difficult and what is that all about yeah you know what deborah it's such a good question i have because i think we all have and the more that i think about it the more that i see it the more that i work with people around this issue the more that i see that you know i, I hate to use generalizations so let's say most of us <laughs> the great majority of us have a conflicted ambivalent relationship to power i think really we all do but let's say the majority of us, um, and and it's understandable why. You know, we've. I think that we fear that if we really stepped into our power, if we really stepped into all that we are, that other people might not be able to handle it, and that we might end up rejected and alone and no fun. Who wants that? Um, I think we also fear that we might abuse it, and no wonder. How many how many abuses of power have we witnessed in our lives? Um, and all we got to do is turn on the news on any given day to witness at least one. And then when you add to that, the fact that we've been conditioned uh, to believe that power is a bad thing, you know, power is a negative thing, power is a scary thing, with quotes like, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Who wants that? You know, what good-hearted person wants to be corrupted? So when you put all that together and you add to the mix that, We've been conditioned to be afraid of the emotions, to run away from our feelings, to avoid conflict. What happens is that we end up giving away our power, our innate, inherent power that nobody can give to us. Nobody can take it away. And that's really important to get. Nobody can take away our power unless we give it away. And that's what happens. And to me, the tragic reason is the reasons for which we give it away. Because as you were saying in the intro, how many times have we said yes, when inside it's really not okay with us? How many times have we overridden our, our preferences, our beliefs, our dreams, our desires, our perceptions, and settled for an illusion of acceptance 
for a false sense of security and for crumbs, morsels of pseudo love. So it's not a good strategy. And what this book talks about is like, how do we step into power in a different way? How do we resolve this conflicted, ambivalent relationship that we have to power into with power so that we can figure out a way to step into it, to own our inherent power in a way that is a match for us, in a way, in a way that doesn't require that we push anybody down, step on them, abuse them, in a way that's not about fear, control, force, domination, manipulation, in a way that is a simple, congruent match for who we are. Um, and that doesn't require putting our knee to on anybody's neck in order to prop ourselves up and feel powerful. I I I am I'm having a hard time finding the words to follow that because that that is making my heart sing because that is exactly the way that that I have been seeing the suffering that my clients come to me with is it's all about the lack of empowerment for whatever reason, you know, maybe we've been brought up to believe certain things. Well, we've definitely been brought up to believe yes. certain things. And, you know, when, when, when I reached age 50 and most of my listeners are at that point and beyond, I noticed a difference in giving myself permission to live differently. And I think that is the key that I've I believe it's the key is that we've got to give ourselves permission to do things differently would you agree yeah yeah because nobody else is going to give you permission right power is not just given away like the existing entrenched power structures are not just going to give it away we have to claim it um, and and we can see that the existing power structures are not going to give it up easily that's part of the the what we're witnessing in the world today. All this all this dramatic change is the shifting power structures. Um, you know, you can and one way we can look at it is is the end of the patriarchy, which can be characterized as this hierarchical power over, you know, my way or the highway, this cowboy mentality. You know, even in leadership styles in the corporate world, you know, it's like you do you do what I say, um, and there's no discussion about it. So we're moving into a more, what we can call a more feminine power with, and which is, by the way, no less powerful. Um, and, and if you ask me, I think it's even a more powerful way of relating to, to power uh, because the other hierarchical nature of, or expression of power is fear-based, and that can only go so far. And, and if I'm standing in my own power, why would I be threatened by anybody else being in their own power? Um, so it, it really is a much more powerful perspective. It's like, hey, I know who I am. I can handle whatever comes my way. And, um, you know, the book is for everybody. Everybody, I think we all struggle with power, but it has a particular message around women's empowerment. And it's to me, it's not to idealize women. It's not to put women up on a pedestal. And certainly not to give women more crap that they have to clean up in this mess that we have made in this world. It's because when I look at the world, we've been running very off balance, very off kilter between the balance between the masculine and the feminine energies in the world, which in, in, in the cosmos and creation, they're balanced, right? We have, there's, a, there's a balance between masculine and feminine. It's only in our minds, in our little human race, that we have turned the feminine into something weakness, into something less than, and which is a completely faulty way of looking. There were so many faulty assumptions made around that. So I believe that when women are in 50% of power in the world, we're going to have a very different relationship to war and to poverty and to hunger, how we treat the environment and to all the other issues that we face as a species. So that's why I believe that the empowerment of women is the single most important thing that needs to happen in this world. Yeah. And you also talk to the men in your book too, because because it has been so imbalanced, the the men have learned how to be a certain way because of the expectations of uh, upon them from society. Um, but I read a book, Jeremy Griffith, uh, called Freedom, and he's talking about how that story, um, when we realize it's just been a story, 
and that it has not been the truth that men have to act this certain way that we have been teaching them for hundreds of years, that it's just been a story that we can get back to the truth of who we are, which really is a balance of masculine and feminine, isn't it? Yes. And and I mean, you're so absolutely right. This hierarchical power over patriarchal approach to power hasn't served anybody. Obviously, it hasn't served women, but it also doesn't serve men. And the reason for that, let's, let's look at a couple of numbers. Longevity. Like in the U.S., women outlive men by five years. You look at those numbers globally, it's seven years. Suicide. In the U.S., and I only have numbers for the U.S. for this, men commit suicide four times as frequently as women do. And in fact, 70% of the suicides in the U.S. are committed by middle-aged white men, which is really interesting to me because that, to me, pretty obviously, uh, the group that holds still the majority of the power in the world. So we, one would think, well, they hold the majority of the power, they have the, the most privileges, the most benefits, but what's going on? Why are they so unhappy? Why are they taking their life so disproportionately? And I think it's what you were pointing to is we have a misunderstanding about masculinity and what it means to be a man. It's a very limited and limiting way of looking at it. And it begins from, from childhood. Little boys don't cry. Mm -hmm. and, and again, what, what a misunderstanding, what a misinterpretation. The assumption in that is that only little girls cry. And, and, so, and so what's wrong with that? It's because of the assumption that the feminine is weakness. It's like, wait a minute. You want to talk about power. You want to talk about strength. You want about courage. Let's talk about the power of creation that resides in the female body. And I hope nobody gets offended by this next story that I'm going to tell, but it's really funny, but it really makes the point. Uh, Betty White, you know, the, who left us last year, um, in her own inimitable way, she was apparently being interviewed in this, one of these communal multiple celebrity interviews, and somebody said something about having balls. And she goes, wait a minute, where do we get this connection between having balls and courage? You thump those little things and the guy bends over, collapses in pain. You want to talk courage? You want to talk strength? You want to talk resilience? Let's talk vaginas. Those things take a pounding. <laughs> uh, and don't forget the childbirth part of it. <laughs> seriously, are you kidding me? Um, and, and so that's part of what I tried. To, and, and, and then the other assumption in that is that the emotions are weakness. It's like, wait a minute, the emotions aren't strength. They're not weakness. They're not good. They're not bad. They're just energy. What used to be spiritual teaching, that everything is energy, now we know from quantum physics. Everything is energy. Even the, what feels solid, like this chair that I'm sitting on, my, the body, it's all energy. It's all vibration, even when it feels solid. We also know from physics, energy cannot be destroyed. So when we stuff for the thousands of times that we have stuffed our emotions, that we haven't said how we felt because we were afraid. You know, we were afraid of the impact that it was going to have on, on a relationship. And But the thing is that those repressed emotions don't just disappear. You can't just sweep them under the rug. They get lodged. Those, un, those, those emotional energies get stuck in the body. And after years and decades and a lifetime of suppressing our emotions, we walk around with layers upon layers upon more layers of repressed emotional crap. And here we are in the present trying to have a relationship and all of it gets filtered through that lifetime of unhealed past trauma and repressed emotions. Yikes. Yikes. Like it's amazing to me that any relationships can work. It's really, and, and then those emotions have to come out one way or another, because what happens is we stuff it and we stuff it and we stuff some more. And then the next poor unfortunate soul Wrong time says something to us in the wrong, the wrong way, and boom, like volcanic eruption. And we cause harms, harm to our relationships. Or suppress, 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 suppress. Those emotions have to come out. And so they start seeping up and seeping out as, and showing up as physical symptoms, heart attacks, ulcers, cancer. And I think that's the part that also connects to the mortality rate between men and women. 
we walk around like, you know, we've been taught to believe that to be a man means you have to walk around like this uncaring, unfeeling robot. And that's, that's not a very healthy approach to life. It's not even truth. <laughs> not even truth. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of uh, leads into the work that you do with the breath work. And, you know, I've, I've been working with breath work with my clients too. And it is such a simple uh, idea, but it has such profound changes on the body and the mind. Do you want to talk a little bit about why you believe the breath work is one of our uh, healing modalities that we all need to start paying some attention to? That's a huge question too, and one that I'm really passionate about. I've been I've been facilitating breathwork for over 30 years. My my dad was a psychiatrist. My degrees in psychology. I was on my way to get a PhD until I discovered breathwork, and after my very first session. I jumped tracks. I never went for the PhD because it works so fast and heals so profoundly at so many levels. And with all due respect to the psychotherapy practice, like like in the right hands with clear goals, it can be incredibly supportive and even life-changing. And we all know you can sit on somebody's couch for 10, 20, 30 years rehashing the same old crap and nothing happens. And here's the reason for that. That trauma no longer lives in the mind. It's been somaticized and now lives in the body. So no amount of talking about it is going to get to it. It's going to clear it. And sure, it, understanding the effect of what happened to us when we were 5 or 10 or 15 beats not understanding. Right? For sure, it's better than. But, it, but the, the blessing, the gift of the breath work is that it bypasses the mind. And it goes to the source of where that trauma now lives in the body, and it clears it quickly. And, and I should probably clarify, too, that there's a, um, breathwork is a really large umbrella. Term. There's a lot of things that are called breathwork or conscious breathing practices. You know, anybody who's been to a yoga class knows the importance of the breath. Uh, the breathwork modality that I'm talking about is, is longer. You, you breathe in a certain way for about an hour, an hour and a half, and amazing things happen. Like I've yet to come across, Deborah, anything that clears that psychological and emotional trauma as quickly and, and as effectively as it does. Like one session can change your life. It did for me. And, you know, they haven't studied breath work in the same way that they've done a lot of research on meditation. Like we have, we know the benefits of what's happening in the body in terms of health, um, of medita- having a, a regular meditation practice in terms of productivity at work. A lot of research. They're just now beginning to research breath work. Here's a really interesting part of it, because I know that sounds too good to be true. Because I got to tell you, it also heals physically. And I know that sounds too good to be true. To the scientific, you know, more skeptical part of me, I know. You're going to tell me that just breathing, I can heal myself? And yeah, (laughs) I am, because I can't argue with the results. Yeah, I can't argue with results. It works, and it works fast. And it works with permanent effect. And here's one way that can begin to open the door to understand, at least it does for me, how it works. And and it's more from a psycho-spiritual perspective. If we think about the fact that in most spiritual traditions in the world, and, and even in several secular languages, one word, the same word, can mean breath or it can mean spirit. If we think about pneuma, you know, in, in ancient Greek, pneuma, from which we get pneumonia, it, that word meant lung and soul. From the Latin spirata, from that root, we get both respiration and inspiration or expiration. So, so that breath-spirit connection is everywhere, all over the world, in the sacred texts. And, and that's what allows me to begin to, to understand how it can heal so profoundly. because. It does. Yeah, I I concur. You know, one of the very common things that I work with my clients with is using the breath as a vehicle to move energy. Yes. So that stuck energy that's in your body, if you're not, if you're holding your breath, you're, you're, you're still holding onto that energy. Exactly. So really just 
the conscious breathing part of it, I, I don't get into breath work, but the conscious breathing part of it, it's so amazing to me that people don't even pay any attention to how they're breathing, but it is the 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 window into what's going on with you, isn't it? It, it, it will tell yes. you exactly how you feel. Totally. And and if you pay attention, just noticing your breath will change your life. And you'll notice like you're, you're referring to. The first thing that goes when we get upset, should we stop breathing? Or we, take, or we start taking really shallow breaths. If you just notice that pattern, you can unwind that. And when we stop breathing, that's what anchors those emotions in the body, those emotional energies. So really important, if you can, by becoming more present to yourself, more aware of what you're doing when um, and what's happening in your body when, when you get triggered, becoming, paying attention, what triggers us, right? What situations, what people, it all begins with that self-awareness because we can't do anything with what we don't, can't see. So any practices that we can do to become more aware of what we do and why and when, it's going to change our lives. And, and just by beginning to do that in relationship to the breath, we can override those, those trained uh, tendencies of, of swallowing our breath, swallowing our emotions. Like even if you're stuck in traffic and you find yourself like getting really angry and upset and worried about being late to a meeting, which is not going to help you get there any faster. That's the moment to slow down your breath, right? Take some really slow deep breath so that those frust energies of frustration can just cycle through you. You can feel it. Of course, we don't want to suppress them, feel it, and then just let them go. Like let those energies, like think about a, a two-year-old you know, the, the, or, or kids, you know, they have a total meltdown. Two minutes later, they're playing like if nothing happened. The reason for that is because they have their emotions fully. So, so they're not filtering them. So then, yeah, right. They felt that emotion. They got it out and then onto the next emotion. We get into trouble with emotions as adults because we filter them and we, and we stuff them and we don't allow ourselves to feel them. And of course, we don't want to walk around like a two-year-old having total meltdowns and temper tantrums. Part of that process of emotional self-mastery is not only learning what we're feeling, Right? Because most of us, if you would have asked me 30 years, 30 years ago what I was feeling, I had no idea. I couldn't tell you what I was feeling. And the son of a psychiatrist studying psychology about my own emotions, I had no idea. And so, for, so that's the first step, that level of self-awareness, then learning how to feel them and communicate them responsibly. Right? And responsibly means owning that it's, there are emotions. Like we were talking about earlier, nobody can make us feel anything unless we allow it and, or unless we have that little trigger, unhealed area in us that gets triggered by somebody saying or doing something. And it doesn't excuse or exonerate what they did or didn't do. It, we're just talking about taking responsibility for our own emotions, which is actually empowering and liberating when we think about it, right? Nobody can make us feel anything. And then learning how to express them with gracefulness in a way, in a way that they can hear them, in a way that the other person can hear them and not just shut down and fight back or tune out. Yeah, that that makes me think about because I know you, I don't know if you've finished it already, but I know you're working on the next book about relationships. So what I'm hearing you saying is knowing this uh and and being self-aware is likely to be key to having good relationships is that right oh my god deborah you know you know that it's true it's like the more self-aware that we are the self-awareness opens opens awareness opens the door to self-acceptance and self-acceptance opens the door to self-love and to me this isn't this isn't theoretical hypothetical um speaking is like i know self-doubt in fact i know self-hatred my entire adolescence was one long depression with suicidal fantasies to boot. And, and so I'm an unlikely person to be talking about, you know, the, hero, the hero's journey and to talk about personal empowerment. But that's, I think, what makes the, the message effective is like, I know what that feels like and I know how to get out of it. And, and that's what the book is about. How do we get out those, those self-made prisons in which we find ourselves stuck? Yeah, we, I talked a little bit 
uh, at the very beginning about if you're a teacher or a healer or, or an activist for change. And, and I do see and have seen the correlation between such a disempowered part of our journey to that being the gift that we offer those that we can help. So yes. what we've experienced is what we end up teaching people, which I think that's what you were just saying is how unlikely, but yes. really it that I think that's how it works. I I think so too, for better or for worse. <laughs> like I wouldn't I wouldn't want to have to do it over. I wouldn't want to go back, but I also wouldn't change it because that depression, that feeling like there was something wrong with me, that I was different. Um, that I was damaged goods, that's what allows me to have empathy for and understanding for what another human being is going with, go, going through so that I can help them by the hand to get out of their own self-made prisons. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't give that away. I wouldn't trade that ability to, to empathize with and feel what somebody else is going through. Hmm. And, and your book is all about awakening the soul of power. So awakening that power within us so that we can do something good with it. What are you hoping that the reader of your book is going to take away from that? It's, it's the, that, the, that message that we were talking about before, that there is a way that you can tap into your power and express it in a way that is a match for you. So you, you know, in the interview, you were talking about the different kinds of power, which to me is the first step towards deconstructing a relationship with it is realizing, you know, what our relationship, how do we think about power? How do we feel about power? Where do we get those beliefs? Um, and being willing to question them. And then the, the whole other layer, layer of self-acceptance, where do I give my power away? I mean, self, self-awareness of, of observing ourselves. As we go through our lives and look here, figuring out where are our triggers? Where did, where did I get my power away? Do I tend to do that with impersonal, romantic, intimate relationships? Or do I tend to give my power away in, in, with authority figures, Maybe like parental figures, bosses, religious leaders, coaches, that kind of thing? So, and nobody can answer those things for us. We could, but, but it takes self awareness, and, and, but it's, it's not hard, right? It's just paying attention. Once we know, then we can do something about it. And so, and then to begin to understand that there are different kinds of power. So you were talking about ego power, the way that that's the way that the, the, the world relates to power in contrast with spiritual power or soulful power that we all have inside of us. So, you know, we tend to think about power or, or relate power to people who have money who are famous or high up in some kind of hierarchy, whether it's a corporate ladder or some kind of other re organization, religious or otherwise. But the thing about all those kinds of powers that they're external, they're outside of us, which makes them fickle. Here today, gone tomorrow. It's depending on it's dependent on that job or that role or or that um, you know amount of money in my bank account. And there's a there's a, a correction in the market and boom, there it goes. Or a, wor a worldwide pandemic, whoops, there goes my job. So that's why they're fickle. They're, that, that kind of power is also very ego-driven. So it's self-aggrandizing. It's always making itself to seem bigger than it actually is. Like blowing itself up uh, to, to come across as bigger and more powerful, which is really overcompensating, but for not feeling good enough or powerful enough. Um, and it always has an agenda. So it's always trying to grab something for itself. It's mine, mine, mine. Um, and, and it's mine and I want it and I want it now. So contrast that with what I call spiritual power or soulful power, which it's not about proving anything. It's humble. It doesn't need to prove anything to anybody. It's about service, about making a difference. It's what we you know, sometimes call the, the servant leader or the servant queen or king. It's, it's somebody who owns that, that role of leadership, not because they need to be stroked in terms of their ego, but because they're about service and making a difference in the world, um, which is the more leadership styles that are, that are popping up now, the more conscious leader are more about that. And so 
I think of Gandhi or Gandalf, if you're into the Lord of the Rings, and, and their simple monastic rows, their sandal feet. From looking at them, you would never know how much power they hold until it's necessary, until it's needed, and then get out of the way. Gandhi brought the British Empire to its knees when it was at its highest point in terms of global reach and influence. And he did that without ever shooting a gun or landing a single punch. That's power. And that's the kind of power that we all have access to. I think we need to send a copy of your book to everybody that's in power right now <laughs> so they can start to look at things a little differently. Maybe, let's hope. Yeah. Wouldn't, so, wouldn't that be something? I, I'm, I, I have a vision that we are all going to find our power and then we can live in harmony. And I hope it's in my lifetime, but I really don't care if it is or if it isn't. I'm on a mission just like you, <laughs> that too. we can build each other up and to really be who we're here to be. But we came to earth for a reason, right? We've got a job to do. We've The idea of owning our power, we can't do our job until we do that. Yes. And so that's why I love your book. I love the way it's laid out for everybody that's listening. Definitely pick up a copy of this book. Christian, where can people learn what to do next when they're inspired and they want to go further? What do you suggest? Well, first of all, I want to thank you. I want to, because I'm so, you having said that, how we share that sense of mission and that, and that relationship to, to the times in which we live. I feel like I, like I have a, a new sister. That I'm so glad we're on the same team. So thank you for doing all you do. Thank you for having the show. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, the book is available wherever books are sold. So you can get it on Amazon. You can get it at your local bookstore. Just order it there if you want to support them. The best way to reach me probably is my website, uh, which is soulfulpower.com, S-O-U-L-F-U-L-P-O-W-E-R.com. From there, they can access my social media. And for anybody in your audience who goes to my website and gets on my email list, and you know how easy it is to click unsubscribe if it doesn't work for you, and I'm not going to take it personally, I promise. Um, We'll send them a sample chapter of the book that talks about what it means to live heroically in the 21st century. We'll send them a PDF of power practices that are designed to become, to help us in that process of self-awareness, becoming more aware of our relationship to power. And we'll send them a, a guided recorded meditation that I did in the middle of the pandemic that talks about how do we maintain a place of center in the midst of chaos. Thanks again, Deborah. Thanks, thank, thanks again for all you do. Oh, and thank you. And those are such wonderful gifts. Thank you for being so generous. And thank you for spending that time with us. This episode of Own the Gray is brought to you by I Am. Discover your unique talents, realize your potential, and align to your path. Take the first step to uncover your life purpose by visiting deborahjones.ca slash courses. This episode of Own the Gray is brought to you by I Am. Discover your unique talents, realize your potential, and align to your path. Take the first step to uncover your life purpose by visiting deborahjones.ca slash courses.